Warning, the following content may be graphic and may not be suitable for all viewers. William Crawford was born in 1722 in Westmoreland County, Virginia, raised near Winchester, Virginia, and lived in western Pennsylvania. He first traveled west over the mountains in 1758 as an officer in the army of General Forbes. Crawford was impressed with the western country and resolved to make it his home. However, hostile Indians prevented him from homesteading until 1765. In that year, Crawford and his half-brother, Hugh Stevenson, came over the mountains via Braddock's Road. Coming to the Yokogany River, they surveyed a tract of land and erected a log cabin. The following year, Crawford, his wife, and four children moved into the one-room cabin. It was a humble dwelling, 14 by 16 foot in size, yet many illustrious men were entertained within, including George Washington, Crawford's longtime friend. Washington and Crawford became acquainted in 1749 when Washington, during his surveying, took lodging with Crawford's family in Virginia. Washington and Crawford were the same age, 17 at the time, and a friendship soon developed. George Washington taught Crawford to survey, and Crawford later surveyed for Washington seven tracts of land in Fayette County, over 2,000 acres. Colonel Crawford distinguished himself during the Revolutionary War and in the Indian Wars along the frontier. He took several Indian towns and did great service in scouting, patrolling, and defending the frontiers. In late 1777, the colonel was sent to western Pennsylvania to take command of the Continental troops and militia in that area. In 1781, he retired from service. The following year, however, he was again engaged in border warfare, this time with the Sandusky Indians of Ohio. On June 10, 1782, Colonel William Crawford was captured with several of his command by hostile Indians and marched to a large village about eight miles above the Sandusky River. Soon the prisoners, all except Crawford and Army Surgeon David Edward Knight, were murdered and scalped. Dr. Knight was held captive, but Colonel Crawford was taken by the Indians, stripped of all clothing, and led to a thick post projected 15 feet from the ground. Bound at the wrist, he was tethered with a rawhide cord to the post. In this way, he was able to walk around the pole, stand, sit, even lie down, but was unable to move more than four feet in any direction from the pole. Soon a crowd of Indians rushed up with sticks and switches and beat Crawford unmercifully, withdrawing only when his body was badly welted and bloodstained, and he appeared on the verge of unconsciousness. The Indians then raced over to where Dr. Knight was tied and subjected him to the same punishment. Colonel Crawford was then informed that his captors planned to burn him. A foot-high circle of kindling was placed all the way around Crawford's stake at a distance of about five yards. About a hundred dry hickory poles, each an inch or so thick and upwards of 20 feet in length, were placed so that they lay with one end atop the kindling and the other stretched outward away from the circle. Crawford was surrounded by a milling mass of Indian warriors and squaws, all of whom carried flintlock rifles. Into the barrels they poured extra large quantities of gunpowder, but no balls, and shot at Colonel Crawford point blank. The grains of powder and saltpeter still burning peppered his body and embedded just beneath his skin. Crawford screamed until he was hoarse and whimpering. More than 70 powder charges had struck him everywhere from feet to neck, but the greater majority had been aimed at his groin. And when they were finished, the end of his member was black and shredded and still smoking. As Dr. Knight watched in horror, one of the Indian leaders stepped up with Colonel Crawford and sliced off his ear. Then the other one. From where he sat watching, Dr. Knight could see only blood flowing down both sides of Crawford's head, bathing his shoulders. 
back and chest. Now then come the squaws with burning brands and they light the kindling all the way around the circle, igniting the material every foot or so until the entire circle was ablaze. The poles quickly caught fire on their tips and the heat became intense, causing the closest spectators to fall back. Crawford made a particular cry and ran around the post in a frenzy trying to escape the flames, finally falling to the ground and wrapping his body around the stake. No man can get through that and live. If any man can. Crawford. Well. After the better part of an hour, the fire died down, leaving behind a fanned out ring of long poles, each with one end, a glowing spike. Crawford's back, buttocks, and the skin on the back of his thighs had blisters and burst, and then curled up into little charred crisps. The sounds he made were fainter. The torture continued as Indians selected poles and jabbed the glowing ends onto Colonel Crawford's skin, where they thought it would give the most pain. Dr. Knight thought Crawford near death by this time, but was amazed to see the colonel scrambling to his feet and begin stumbling about the stake, attempting to avoid the glowing ends that hissed and smoked whenever they touched him. One of the glowing points was thrust at his face, and as he jerked to avoid it, he ran into another, which contacted his open eye, causing him to shriek loudly. When the poles had all been used and tossed onto the pile to one side, some of the squaws came up with wooden boards and scooped up piles of glowing embers to throw at him until soon he had nothing to walk upon but coals of fire and hot ashes. As Colonel Crawford circled the stake, he began to plead for someone to shoot him, to kill him. Most of the Indians did not understand what Crawford was saying but the beseeching tone of the colonel's voice pleased them, and they clapped their hands and shouted aloud in triumph at having forced the white chief into this outburst. When there was no answer to his pleads, Crawford began a shuffling walk around and around the stake as if in a trance, scarcely flinching as he stepped on the hot coal. Simon Gertie had been there, and watched the torture happen. Gertie refused to give in to Crawford's pleas to shoot him, knowing it might mean his own death if he did. Finally, he stopped and slowly raised his head and loudly and clearly prayed for God to end his suffering. Once more, he began the same shuffling walk until at last, two full hours after having been prodded with the glowing poles, he fell on his stomach and lay silent. At once, an Indian chief stepped over the ring of ashes and cut a deep circle on the top of Colonel Crawford's head with his knife, wrapped the long, dark hair around his hand, and yanked hard. The pop as the scalp pulled off was clearly audible to Dr. Knight. The chief now stepped clear of the circle and advanced on the captive doctor. He held the dripping scalp in front of Dr. Knight's eyes and taunted him. With rapid strokes, he whipped the fleshy portion of the scalp back and forth across Knight's face, stopping only when there came a deep murmur from the crowd behind him. A squaw had entered the circle of ashes with a board heaped full of glowing coals, and these she scattered on Crawford's back and held them with the board against the officer's bare skull. The murmur that had arised was occasioned by what seemed wholly unbelievable. Colonel Crawford groaned faintly and rolled over and then slowly drew up to his knees and raised himself to a kneeling position. For perhaps two minutes, he stayed like this and then he placed one foot on the ground and stood erect again, beginning anew a shuffling walk around the stake. A few squaws touched burning sticks to him, but he seemed insensitive to them no longer even attempting to pull away. It was the most appalling sight Dr. Knight had ever witnessed, and unable to control himself any longer, he suddenly vomited and then screamed at his captors, cursing them and calling them murderers and fiends and devils. Squaws now heaped armloads of fresh kindling a pile near the stake and lighted it. 
When the fire reached its peak, two warriors cut the rawhide cord that bound the still shuffling Crawford, and on each side let him shuffle towards the fire. When the heat became too intense for them to advance closer, they thrust him from them, and he sprawled into the blaze. His legs jerked a few times, and one arm flailed out, but then as skin and flesh blackened, living motion stopped, and all that remained was a gradual drawing of arms and legs close to the body in a pugilistic posture, characteristic in persons burned to death. In revenge for the Natanhutton massacre, the American Indians tortured Crawford before burning him at the stake. So ended the life of Colonel William Crawford. Dr. Knight, who had witnessed Crawford's sufferings, was later turned over by the Delaware to the Shawnees, from whom he later escaped. Dr. Knight eventually reached safety in a white settlement and gave a report of the events. Later, he published his famous narrative, which described the sad end of Colonel Crawford. Well, thanks guys for watching this video. If you like this video and videos like this from the American frontier, please subscribe to the channel, smash that like button, and share it with your friends. And as always, get out there and explore. Thanks guys.